Can you imagine 4,000 years passing and you're not even a memory? Think about it, friends. It's not just a possibility. It's a certainty. That is a quote from a man you would probably say you've never heard of. This is despite him inspiring a slew of comedians, including Jerry Seinfeld, Penn Jillette of uh, Penn and Teller fame, and Harry Shearer. He's a voice on The Simpsons. Anyway, uh, he's also inspired filmmakers, writers, and more. And uh, he also pulled off one of the greatest hoaxes slash practical jokes of modern times. And despite all that, you, you also, you've probably seen his work and uh, hearing and hearing. You've heard his voice probably every year for decades. Seriously, for decades. Um, keep listening to find out who the hell I'm talking about and how you probably know him. Or, um, or you could just search for the quote. But, but where's the fun in that? Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. podcast version of sitting at the back of the class and the front of the class at the same time. What that means, I don't know. But uh, I am Elton, the one in the title, and I read a book a week. I do read a book a week. For the book uh, this time around, and especially its author, it's A Fistful of Fig Newtons by Jim. 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 Fucking Jim. I've been reading about this guy for like weeks. Anyway, um, no, his name is Gene Shepard. He wrote the book A Fistful of Fig Newtons. What a weird and wonderful book. Uh, by a guy who had a weird, and many would say wonderful job. Um, this one made me realize how hard it is for me to reconcile having a media celebrity person type person be such a regular part of my life, yet uh, never knowing anything about them. It's like learning the janitor that worked at your school, uh, you know, when you went to school, one of your schools. Learning that that guy, uh, he, thought up, uh, he thought up Oreos, or invented LSD, or created the Trisket, or something, you know. But the chances are, if you've been alive for the past 40 years, or come of, came of age during those years, during those, yes, if you came of age during those years, uh, Gene Shepard, or Shep, as he liked to be called, is someone you've known for a long time. Maybe not, maybe not old friends, best friends, or anything like that, but you probably have a few good memories associated with him. Better still, if you grew up under the parental glow of a TV's nurturing light. You know him better than you know your neighbor, probably, because who the fuck knows their neighbors anymore? I say that from the perspective of a shut-in who views the people outside his windows as ghosts, or or they want to steal my soul, or, you know, just deliver my Amazon packages. This brings me to our first sponsor, Amazon, a company committed to customer service that would like to remind you that last year, in an effort to combat the effects of inflation and still provide excellent customer service to their millions of prime customers, Amazon distributed thousands of specially designed urination and defecation bottles made to be used while traveling, so all their drivers would have to make less stops, guaranteeing your packages arrived on time. Amazon, where our customers are a prime concern not our drivers or employees. And scene. No, that was in no way real or attached to reality in any way, shape, or form. Not that I know of, anyway. It did, however, um, more than likely ruin my chances of sponsorship by Amazon in a very real way. So, screw you, future Elton, and your need for money or to make money off this podcast. Screw yourself. A Fistful of Fig Newtons is said to be a collection of essays by Gene Shepard, published in 1991. And I would agree with that assessment, but I don't, I don't totally agree with it, all right? It's, it's not the content I don't agree with. It's the fact that, that they're calling the stories in it essays. Like, what the, f I don't, what the shit? I take, I take umbrage. Plus, I'm pretty sure I just used umbrage correctly just now. So, can I get a high five? Seriously, I just high five the air. I did. You can too. Come on, participate a little. Come on. No? Yeah? I hope you did. It just happened that I used umbrage and I'm really fucking proud. 
at the moment, and I'm going on about this way too long. My pride aside, this book, in my opinion, is a collection of short stories, told through the lens of a character in an overarching, arching story. I know there has to be a little more, like a, there's probably a, liter, a more literary way of saying that, like a, like they probably have a word for that, and I'm probably splitting hairs here with the essays and the story thing, but hell. But, you know, um, to hell with it. To hell with it, I say. And to be fair, the best way to describe it is probably a collection of essays, and I'm just a fucking idiot. The book is a story and collection of stories, uh, stories and essays or stories. Most, I'm, collection of stories about a guy named Ralph Parker, who is thinking of shit while, um, damn it, I'm getting ahead of myself. I do that, I do that a lot. I mean, you need context first because A, it helps, and B, why not broaden your mind with some unexpected, non harmful information? How often does that ever happen, right? Just interesting stuff that doesn't immediately force you into some kind of internal debate or wants you to pick a side. Something that doesn't try to manipulate your position on a topic one way or another. Just a good old healthy dose of information to help you expand your mind and grow as a person. That's nice, isn't it? It's nice, right? Personally, I got a lot out of this one, this book. It, uh, it was like moving through a train of thought in someone else's mind. The style of writing that facilitates it is, is really uh, pretty amazing. Uh, it was sweet, in a homespun, yet snarky kind of way. It's good. It, it's really good. You should, you should buy it. And you should, you should want to buy If you should want to buy it, I'll leave a link in the description for it. Um, buying it, using that link, gives me a little kickback from Amazon, since they're never going to fucking sponsor me. And, uh... A little book dealing bribe uh, from Amazon is not too shabby, though it is tiny. Still, it's something. So buy the book with my linky thing in the description. And you get a book, and I get a few nickels. Win, motherfucking win, right? Buy, 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 buy it. Moving on now. Gene Shepard was a brilliant writer, in addition to invading your childhood every Christmas. Yep, he did, and I'm guessing maybe still does. We'll get to that in a bit, but he was known for many things, as we'll find out, that I would never knew about at all. Gene Shepard, who preferred the name Shep, nickname Shep, uh, he was an American writer, humorist, and radio and television personality, best known for his funny and often satirical storytelling style. He was born Gene Parker Shepard Jr. on July 26th, 1921 in Hammond, Indiana, he was raised there until ultimately being forced into servitude at the age of five to raise alpacas and model Christmas elf costumes for local costume makers. It was a hard life, no doubt, but after picking up a regular smoking habit and able to start a bar tab at the tender age of six, the days flew by in fits of coughing and binge drinking that often... Just why? What, what, why would you say that? I, uh, I honestly don't know. Hey, and stop interrupting me, damn it. I'll think about it. Can you just keep the damn train on the tracks for the love of God? I'll work on it. That was slash wasn't uh, from the TV show. In case you're new and this is your first episode. Uh, she tends to pop in here uh, mysteriously and without warning via some unknown means. I, I don't even know how or why anymore. Gene Shepard wasn't forced into servitude. Uh, he was raised in a regular old, boring, non-alpaca, non-smoking, I don't know, maybe he did smoke, I don't know. But he was raised by a middle-class family. No word on a uh, smoking habit, really, or when it started, if it ever started, I don't know. Definitely didn't involve servitude, at least not that I'm aware of. But, you know, uh, well, at least not at that age, anyway. I mean, there's nothing saying it didn't happen, though, Right? It did not not happen. No, no, it it did not 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 happen. Something like that. You know what I mean. His father was a, a department store manager and worked in a dairy uh, for a time, and his mother was a homemaker. Unfortunately, he wouldn't be in Shep's life for long, as he would later abandon the family at some point. This would rear its ugly head later in, in other ways. 
Yeah, fucking sad is what it is, and a little bit of foreshadowing. <laughs> hey, clever. Growing up in Hammond, Illinois, a steel town just outside Chicago, Gene spent his formative years at good old 2907 Cleveland Street. This was during the 1920s and 30s. Oh, by the way, of the two houses on Cleveland Street that the Shepherdses and baby Jeannie Shep called home, uh, the one at 2907 has the strongest claim as the Gene Shepherd boyhood home. Why? Because on the fateful day of February, February, why can I never say that fucking month? Because on that fateful day of February 18th, 1939, I fucking nailed that. Um, a 17 year old Gene etched his name in the attic rafters, forever defiling the sanctity of its sacred structure. I think it's safe to blame his absent father for this reckless abandonment of morals regarding vandalism. So beat that other house. Fucking Shep carved up the fuck out of the other one. Your shitty non-marred woodwork lacks a signature, I'm afraid. Suck a dick. Atop the mountain of proof establishing that particular domicile as the correct housing of the young shepherd, there rests upon it the great weight of such a storied history now. The owner and its current... The owner. The house and its current owners are so proud of that illustrious storied history and heritage that according to the great visuals of a YouTube video I watched about that house, you can but glance at it as you drive by. So, a great visit if you happen to be on your way to somewhere else and are able to identify the house at a safe speed while going by. Seriously. In reality, I'm guessing the owners have seen a lot of random onlookers taking video and pictures of their house for years and have no idea why. Shep? Who the fuck? What the shit is a Shep? Well, well look. Uh, hey, look. I'll have a... I'll look it up on my phone, okay? <laughs> when I'm at the police station later to make a statement as to why I shot some fucking asshole who was standing on my front lawn taking pictures of my fucking house. Get off my lawn! Yeah. On we go. Later, Gene would steal a lot from his hometown and fill his radio shows with references to it. You thought I meant really stealing, didn't you? Like, <laughs> he would steal. Like, say, for instance, the Main Street in Old Hammond, uh, Illinois, is Holman Avenue, which is the name of the fictional town he often talked about in his stories. Way to blatantly mind reality for your fun and profit, Gene. I'm sure the people of Hammond loved you prostituting their entire city to further your career. It's sickening, Gene. Sickening. I'm kidding. Shep's family lived in the Hessville neighborhood, where he also attended Warren G. Harding Elementary School, a school he would shit-talk a lot later, yet use as a setting for his many stories about growing up. His childhood neighborhood, chud, hood, his hood, would pop up a lot in his stories too. And despite his books and films containing the typical disclaimers about resemblance to f individuals living or dead, you know, times, all that, uh, and that it's all been made up, um, he did actually live near families named Schwartz, Flickinger, and even Bumpus. Those names were reused famously for his popular kiddom stories. You know, kiddom. I don't know. As a year, <laughs> I get it, kiddom, but it's not a word. Anyway, as a youth, he would briefly work as a mail carrier in a steel mill, <laughs> earning his amateur radio license. Uh, he also did that. Um, his I guess his call letters were W9QWN. He earned that license at the age of 16, while also working uh, at a local Hammond, Indiana radio station, WJOB, W Job, as an announcer while still in high school. So he did all that pretty young. And uh, oddly enough, when I learned that uh, in his ham radio days as a kid, he earned a license, I thought earned. Don't you just send in money or something and they give you the license? N no. To obtain a license, you uh, you need to pass a 35-question multi-choice, multi-choice, multiple-choice 
a 35-question multiple-choice written licensing exam for which all the possible questions and answers are public information. So it's really not that hard. You need to not... You need to not... You, you need not... Jesus. You need not be a U.S. citizen. Though you must have a valid photo identification. And there is no lower or upper age limit. So babies can get a license if, if they need one for ham radio operation as infants often do. Um, knowledge of Morse code, by the way, is no longer required for any U.S. amateur radio license or renewals, uh, which are required every 10 years, by the way. And the renewals do not involve an exam. Which reminds me that this episode is also brought to you by the American Radio Relay League, who would like to remind you that operating a ham radio is permission to do whatever you want over the radio. Want to broadcast someone else's music and call it your own? You can do that! Want to threaten your neighbor publicly with no legal recourse? You can do that too. You can do so much, you would think it was illegal. But you'd be wrong, because it's not. Ham radio. It's like trolling the world through the radio. Fuck yeah! So run out and buy an ass load of radio equipment and get your motherfucking license today. Holy shit. I didn't know you could do all that stuff with a licensed ham radio station. This is the uh, the harmless learning stuff I was talking about earlier. What great information. Oh, imagine if I weren't kidding and all that stuff I just made up was real. It would be hilarious if some now obscure rarefied hobby were devoid of any legal ramifications and the population in general had no clue about it. Not because it was hidden, but because it was such a nerdy proposition to undertake. Wait. I can threaten someone over the airwaves and have it broadcast to anything with a radio antenna for miles around, and there's nothing anyone can do about it? Fuck yeah! Fuck yeah! And and now all I have to do is, 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 is what now? Wait, I have to learn about, like, squelching, signal-to-noise ratios, band sweeping? W- more shit, too? Oh, fuck that. I'll, I'll fucking pass. I'm not a fucking nerd. The freedom isn't worth the boredom. I can imagine way too many people feeling that way, actually. Uh, Operating a ham radio does sound cool, though. There are a few sites online where you can listen to ham radio stations, and I spent almost an hour doing it. And I'm not going to lie, I would like most of my hour back. Other than being able to listen to Chinese radio and music coming out of Madrid, Spain, I I don't get it. I'd probably be one of the people uh, I made fun of earlier. I'm not going to lie. Uh, the people that just, it's too much to learn. That doesn't that doesn't mean it's not fun. It's just not my thing, you know, I think. God bless you ham radio operators. You're doing, you're doing amazing work that I'm uh, probably never going to do or um, be interested enough in figuring out. I love you. After graduating from Hammond High School in 1939, Gene Shepard just so happened to be the exact right age for the meat grinder that was World War II. And let's be honest, who doesn't love a good post-high school coming-of-age, life-or-death nightmare drawn out for years? Am I right? Fuck, what a terrible time to be the exact right age to enter the military, you know? Fucking terrible. He joined the Army, serving in the Signal Corps, which was, uh, fucking with radar equipment and uh, communication kind of stuff. All that, uh, uh, that kind of shit. Anyway, uh, his his adventures in the Army Signal Corps and stories of the obscure and infamous, uh, they were obscure and infamous, and were all fertile sources uh, for his tales or something like that. He used them in his stories. Briefly, uh, he returned to WJOB in 1945 upon his discharge from the U.S. Army, um, as documented by the 1945 Hammond City Directory. So if you want to look that up, it's in there. I did. Still, Shepard himself eagerly left Indiana after his World War II service and stint at the station. People ask me if I'd miss Hammond, he told a crowd at the county library in 1984. Do you miss the cold sores you had last week? How fucked up is that? Uh, Right to the fucking town. Fuck you! No, I'm kidding. Uh, But he said that. It's fucked up. Anyway, I think it is. Still, despite some of the obviously bad memories associated with his hometown, uh, like his dad leaving and such, foreshadowing, 
he managed to come to some kind of terms with Hammond. Obviously, he was speaking at their library in 1984. And um, he made regular public appearances in his last in the last three decades of his life. On the south end of his Hessville neighborhood is the Gene Shepherd Community Center, opened in 2003. So it seems like Hammond um, g- forgave him, I guess. Uh, they feel all right about Gene Shepherd being from their town, you know? Uh, he attended, <laughs> nothing they could do about it, but, you know, they've, they've come to agreeable terms. Uh, he attended uh, Indiana University, sporadically, where he majored in radio and television and began his career as a radio host and DJ. And uh, he started that in Cincinnati, Ohio, kind of. Well, he started in high school, but really started getting paid. Uh, During the initial parts of his career, he was constantly fired from radio presenting jobs, owing to his style of talking more and playing less music, which this would all pay off for him later. Despite facing a risk of failed of a failed career, Gene stuck with it and maintained that style and frequently switched between jobs. So, he got canned a shit ton for talking too much. Chep did a DJ show from Schuler's Wiggum on WSAI and a nightly comedy show he initiated on WLW called Rear Bumpers. This led to a television career at KYW in Philadelphia. His style of engaging the audience through humorous storytelling was considered a milestone in radio broadcasting. He told stories from his childhood and talked about random things, such as human nature and life in America, and gained a huge fan following. In 1956, Shep moved to the Big Apple uh, on WOR in New York. For years, listeners all over the Northeast were uh, treated to a nightly dose of genius. His shows were a menagerie of comments, silly songs, jokes, and other digressions, all orbiting around a central tale as per. Uh, for 45 minutes, you laughed and wondered if he would uh, if he'd remember to conclude the story at hand. And he always made it. His show, which ran from 1956 to 1977, was a mixture of the unique voice of Gene Shepard, spinning long, rambling tales about his childhood, his travels, and his observations on life in general. Canadian philosopher Marshall McLaughlin, 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 M-C-L-U-H-A-N, McLaughlin. Um, He once called Shep the first radio novelist. His other great radio expertise was live broadcasts on Saturday night from the Limelight, a uh, nightclub in Greenwich Village. Uh, Greenwich, 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 Greenwich Village. It's Greenwich Village, Greenwich Village. Fuck. It's that. Sometimes described as the inventor of the talk radio, he originated a unique type of show featuring extended monologues, like I mentioned earlier, stories about his everyday life, pranks, and uh, self-reflexive absurdist tangents. Um, It sounds like his radio show, but he put it on stage. In some ways, his sense of humor and comedic social commentary fit with the so-called serious and sick, quote-unquote sick, humor of the 1950s, which took cynical aim at social conformity and the grim but ignored aspects of everyday life. Most of this next bit that I'm going to talk about here is from the site flicklibs.com, which is about Gene Shepard and his weird world and life and stuff. At first, Shep did his show from the WOR transmitter site in Carteret, New Jersey, from 1 a.m. until 4.30 a.m., five nights a week. For three and a half hours, he talked uninterrupted. He played no music and only broke stride for the occasional commercial, which he detested. Many commercials were done live, and he would constantly poke fun at the sponsors. Management hated it, the listeners loved it, and the sponsors endured it. Sometime around 1961, he settled into a 45-minute nightly format, which was heard in the 915, 1015, or 1115 time slots. Uh, Every night, the show was different. Often the subject was related to the season, holiday, or a trip he had had, uh, taken. Uh, Other nights, he would tell a childhood or army story, many of which ended up in various printed media he contributed to, or in one of his four books. Um, Some even went on to become movies. Uh, He did uh, 
four PBS, and two commercial release movies, the most well-known being A Christmas Story. Yep, that one. He always told a story in the first person, because he felt it was more believable to the listener. He was so convincing that many felt he was telling real stories of his childhood. Shep constantly claimed that it was all fiction, although he did have friends named Flick and Swart Swartz? Flick and Schwartz. And that's very true. Uh, after listening to a few radio interviews he did, one or two of them had a listener call-in portion, and the majority of those calls um, were asking him if the stuff he talked about was real. That's that's nuts. Anyway, uh, Shep often said that there were five to ten hours of preparation for uh, each of his nightly shows, and yet a fellow WOR personality, Barry Farber, and one of his engineers, Herb Squire, say that it all came off the top of his head. Herb uh, claims that Shep would come into the studio... Studio. Shep would come into the studio with only a scrap of paper, uh, maybe a few notes, perhaps an article that someone had sent him. Um, he would sit down behind the mic and ask the theme song, uh, which was Ba Frey by Edward Strauss. Um, as that would play, he would ease into 45 minutes of non-stop chatter. He would start out talking about a particular subject. And through the course of the show, would sidetrack to other related topics um, and stuff like that. He, uh, but, but as the theme music at the end of the show came to a close, he managed to tie it all together and bring the show to an end. Another stunt that he, uh, that he liked to pull was hurling, was hurling invective. I, I love this. Uh, he would instruct his listeners to place their radios in the open window of their house and turn the volume all the way up. He would yell things over the radio like, You filthy pragmatist, I'm gonna get you! With a... What a weird guy. Um, but also pretty fucking funny. In 1956, Shep drew attention uh, to himself, I guess, by having his quote-unquote night people followers go into bookstores all over the city asking for the book called I Libertine, uh, which did not exist. The, uh, the night people, he said, were different than day people. In that the night person, he said, uh, believed in the world of the office. He really believes in filing cabinets. The time between 8 a.m. to 6 in the evening is the time he's alive. <sighs> this prompt to his listeners to ask for a book that didn't exist would lead to one of the most successful literary hoaxes of all time. The idea for it began when Gene visited a, a bookstore. Uh, when he couldn't find a book he was looking for on the shelves, a clerk informed him the book must not exist because it it hadn't appeared on any publisher's list the clerk had ever seen. Shepard was positive the book existed, but no amount of insistence on Shepard's part would budge the clerk from his certainty. This encounter would prove to be the fuel for the fire to come. Years later, Shepard described the hoax's genesis while uh, while a guest on Long John Nebel's radio show, WFMU, saying, uh, I was uh, new to New York, and I suddenly became aware that New York is almost entirely a city that really does run on lists. But, he asked his listeners, has it occurred to you that these lists are, comp are compiled <laughs> by mortals and that they are human, just like you, and in fact... They have many more axes to grind than you. Shepard decided that he wanted to get a book on the bestseller list. An imaginary book. What do you say tomorrow? Each one of us walk into a bookstore and ask for a book that we know does not exist. He asked his listeners, and they, and they did. Invading bookshops in the hundreds to seek their copy of I Libertine. The request also came in from uh, Paris and Rome as pilots and flight attendants, uh, natural night people, it seems, uh, did their duty and asked for I Libertine wherever, it, wherever they landed. The book ultimately made the New York Times bestseller list before ever being printed. At this point, um, he worked with a, an author named Ted Sturgeon, uh, uh, an author, a writer author. Uh, he worked with Ted Sturgeon and Ballantine Books uh, to come up with a story and write a book, which they published, published, Jesus, I can't speak today, which they published and sold the ever-loving shit out of. 
because it was on the Times bestseller list. It helped sell the book. That's fucking brilliant. Though that wasn't Jean's only successful publishing endeavor. No, no, no. Shepard was also a pretty prolific writer himself. I said all those words. Uh, he was pretty prolific uh, himself, uh, penning several books based on his radio and television work, one being In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash, which was later adapted into the film mentioned earlier, A Christmas Story. He Well, part of it was. He also wrote for several uh, magazines, including Playboy and Mad, and contributed essays to The New Yorker. Holy shit, my mouth does not want to work right now. Shep also insisted that his books were novels, not memoirs or collections of sh- or collections of short stories. Well, fuck you, Mr. Shep. I disagree with you and whoever called them essays. They're short stories, you published writer. <laughs> Probably knew more than me about it. <laughs> Whatever. He also insisted that his literary works were fictional, that Homan was a mythical place, a uh, composite of all the region's industrial communities. Yet, his description of his fictional Homan um, accurately describes the geography of his actual boyhood neighborhood in Hammond, Indiana. The Indiana Harbor Steel Mills, I can't speak today. But maybe I should just do it like that. The Indiana Harbor Steel Mills. And the Standard Oil refinery were just a few miles upwind. Even closer was the polluted Grand Kalmuth River to the south were the brackish waters of the little Calum- Calumet. Calumet. And to the east, the Gary City Dump. So much reality, yet so much fiction. With this... <laughs> Fuck, what am I doing? <laughs> oh my god. With its gra- <laughs> Wow, I'm sorry. <laughs> Fuck me, man. Um, oh, fucking hell. Should I, should I feel like I want to keep going and doing that? I'll do one more. I'll do a little bit more. I'm sorry. I'm just self indulging <laughs> at this point. <laughs> fucking shit. With its grouchy parents. Con- confrontations with school board, school board, <laughs> with schoolyard bullies. <laughs> what is going on? Oh, okay. I'll start back at the beginning. <laughs> the Indiana. <laughs> uh, I'm keeping all this in. I don't care. <laughs> I'm losing my brain. Okay, <clears throat> I'm keeping this in. I'm, I'm so sorry. The Indiana Harbor Steel Mills and the Standard Oil Refinery were just a few miles upwind. Even closer was the polluted Grand Calumet River. To the south were the brackish waters of the Little Calumet and to the east, the Gary City Dump. So much reality, yet so much fiction. With its grouchy parents' confrontations with schoolyard bullies, Gene Shepard's books were a fanciful blur of fiction sourced from reality. His masterful execution of that concoction made his books and the stories in them feel like memories made from real experiences. Shepard admired the now largely forgotten Midwestern author, George Aid, um, an author who came to prominence during the Indiana Golden Age of Literature. I bet you didn't know there was one, but now you do. Uh, He was a columnist for the Chicago Tribune, authored over 20 books, and even penned several successful Broadway productions. Gene commented on Aid's short stories, writing, Almost all of their humor is of the school of futility. All uh, are the subject to the same trivial emotions and continual tiny frustrations, rich and poor alike. The trivia of life, including the bric-a-brac, of popular culture and mass-produced junk was the uh, stuff worth examining. As Shepard put it, the reality of what we really are is oftentimes found in the small snips way down at the bottom of things. In addition to his radio and writing work, uh, Shepard also 
uh, was a frequent guest on television talk shows, even hosting his own uh, television show, uh, Gene Shepard's America, in the 1970s. He also acted in several films, including The Phantom of the Open Hearth and The Great White Hope, which aired on public television nationwide. However, his most noteworthy accomplishment is the writing of the screenplay for the popular movie A Christmas Story. It's a classic from MGM Studios. The film has become a staple of holiday television. It was adapted from Red Rider Nails the Cleveland Street Kid. One of the stories in Mr. Shepard's uh, best-selling 1966 book, In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash. The movie, which was co-written by Shep, was based on a story found in that book, um, which is a collection of semi-autobiographical, which is a collection of semi-autobiographical short stories. See, Shep? God damn it. Short stories that uh, Shepard wrote for Playboy magazine during the 1960s, with some elements from his 1971 book, Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories and Other Disasters. The core idea slash story um, the movie is based on, of course, is The Duel in the Snow, or Red, Wa- or Red Rider Nails the Cleveland Street Kid. Um, a Christmas Story ritualistically plays on television in the United States, all the fucking time, um, during the holidays, especially, uh, cable channels, uh, TBS and TNT feature the TV marathon, 24 hours of Christmas story. It is a polarizing bit of pop culture. Actually, some people love it. Others hate it. I don't know how you would hate it, but some people do. And, uh, others see it as part of an anodyne backdrop, uh, in the March toward Christmas. Don't you? I mean, you know, Christmas is coming when you see that on TV, um, this is how I kind of know who Gene Shepard was. I didn't know his name, you know, of course, uh, he was just the adult version of Ralphie narrating the movie. I never questioned it. Actually, I never even knew the person's name narrating. It was, I was never curious as to who, who owned that voice, you know, yet there it was year after year, a staple of the holiday season. You know, it's, it's, Every year. Thinking back, A Christmas Story was the only Christmas movie I could think of that I could really relate to. All the rest seemed a little too glossed over or over the top and sappy. You know, White Christmas, uh, Miracle on 34th Street. All those all those movies just seemed a little too hokey or something. I don't know. A Christmas Story, to me, didn't have that kind of sheen. It was just snarky with a, with a hint of sarcasm and angst. It was the perfect holiday movie for... For me, a disenfranchised, sullen, dark humor tinged kid who, uh, it, it, was, it was the right kind of movie for me to see during my formative years. You know what I mean? Uh, still, never once did I or anyone else I knew bother to wonder who owned the voice that guided us through that movie. Uh, shit. Wait, for those who have never seen the movie, of course, uh, uh there's got, there's probably a few at this point. I mean, come on. Uh, Regular TV isn't a thing anymore. It's all YouTube and clips and and Netflixing kind of services and shit. Um, I should tell you what it is. You know, due diligence and all that. The movie was based on a handful of monologues by Gene Shepard. That's Shepard's folksy streetwise voice you hear. And the voiceover narration is Ralphie's adult self. He's the one telling the tale, the narration. In addition to providing the voiceover narration... Uh, Gene Shepard wrote it, and he also had a cameo uh, in the movie as a grouchy department store customer that tells Ralphie to go to the back of the line uh, in the Santa line scene. You know, with the you know, shoot your eye out, kid, when he puts a boot in his face. That that scene. Uh, the screenplay adaptation was written by Shepard himself, as I mentioned a few times already, along with Bob Clark, the uh, dir- the director of the movie, and Gene Shepard's third wife, Lee Brown. It all started when Clark, Bob Clark, uh, was in Miami driving to pick up his date, and he heard Shepard on the radio telling the story of Flick, a boy who was triple dog dared into putting his tongue on a metal pole in the dead of winter, and it instantly froze to the pole. Clark had never heard a story quite like that. He was so enthralled, he was 45 minutes late for his date. He was just circling the block. Uh, to hear the rest of the story. He resolved, right then, 
I will do a movie of this man's work. And it took him 12 years. Despite the movie eluding, uh, despite it eluding a sense of, of nostalgia for simpler times or some bygone era, most of the people alive to see the movie uh, weren't allowed to see that era. Um, Gene never saw it that way. Shepard hated the idea that people thought his work was nostalgic. He described it as anti-sentimental, as a matter of fact. If you really read it, you realize it's a put-down of what most people think it stands for. It's anti-nostalgic writing. Shepard's biographer, Gene Bergman, points out that the line in the film that best describes Shepard's attitude towards life is when they're putting, uh, they're getting ready for Christmas dinner, and the old man is sitting in the living room reading the funny papers. The viewer can see the Bumpus' hounds starting to trot past him, but he doesn't see them because the paper's blocking his view. And of course, we know what's going to happen. The hounds are going to get a hold of the, the Christmas turkey. It's a good scene in that movie. So Shepard says in his voice narration, Ah, life is like that. Sometimes at the height of our revelries, when our joy is at its zenith, when all is, <laughs> when all is most right with the world, the most unthinkable disasters descend upon us. Hey, real quick, sorry to cut in here, but you know what's better than Christmas, Elton? An ad break. You know what else is better than Christmas? The look on your face when I told you that. Cut to an ad! I still haven't given a synopsis of the movie, damn it. All right, um, here's a quick and dirty one. Nine-year-old Ralph Ralphie Parker wants only one thing for Christmas— an official Red Rider carbine action, 200 shot range model air rifle with a compass in the stock and this thing which tells time. Between run ins with his younger brother Randy and having to handle school bully Scott Farkas and his sidekick Grover Dill, I never knew that kid's name was Grover Dill, despite him having to deal with all that, Ralphie does not know how he will ever survive long enough to get the BB gun for Christmas. Frequently at odds with his cranky dad, Darren McGavin, but comforted by his doting mother, who's played by Melinda Dillon, uh, Darren McGavin plays his dad, uh, Ralphie struggles to make it to Christmas with his glasses and his hopes intact. This is from an Atlantic piece about Gene. Uh, without Gene Shepard, there would be no Christmas story. And the movie resonates so strongly because he had a unique talent for making his audience feel like like his stories were their own. You can tell a story about anything, he told an interviewer in 1971. An interviewer. <laughs> but the only stories that have any fidelity, any feeling, are stories that either did happen to you or conceivably could have happened to you. I, I would agree with that. What do you think? A couple of fun facts about the movie for those of us that haven't been in a pretty deep coma for the, uh, the past 40 years. And for those that, that have been and are inexplicably listening to this podcast to try and fill themselves in on what has happened with the world since they went comatose, admittedly, that's probably a very small, small portion of this audience, um, if they actually exist at all. But but I'm happy to help. Uh, um, I mean, you, you should probably see the movie first before you learn about these facts, but you should... Um, you, I mean, there's lots of things you probably should have been awake for that I, I'm not. I don't really have time to fill you in on. Like, you know, you you weren't awake. You weren't awake for the Great Mushroom Uprising in the early 2000s when thousands uh, were devoured by by giant man-eating fungi. Uh, we we have since reconfigured the the fungi's DNA, and they've gone back to being harmless again. <laughs> no thanks to you who slept through it all. Uh, I'm kidding, of course. Hey, if anyone has a sense of humor, it's the long-term comatose patient. Am I right? Moving on. Um, the fun, the, the facts uh, about a Christmas story. I don't know why I did the fungi thing, but there it is. I'm leaving it in. I don't care. Um, fun fact things about the movie. Um, three, the three, <laughs> three leg lamps were made for the movie, and all were broken on set during the filming. The Radio Orphan Annie decoder pin that Ralphie receives is the 1940 Speedomatic model, indicating that the movie takes place in December 1940. Uh, different decoder badges were made each year from 1935 to 1940. By 1941, the decoders were made of paper due to uh, World War II metal shortages. 
The film was released just before Thanksgiving and became a surprise hit. Um, by the time Christmas rolled around, the movie had already been pulled from most theaters because it had been played out. You know, they, they're only in theaters for so long. After complaints were lodged at the, th at the theater owners and the studio, the film played on select screens until after the first of the year, 1984. A Christmas Story inspired the creation of the Wonder Years television show, if you remember that one. Uh, Bob Clark had the idea to cut the floors out of the set. This I didn't know. He cut the floors out of the set so that the camera would be at Ralphie's height, at 4 feet 2 inches. So that the perspective is not that of the adults looking down on the child actors, but Ralphie's point of view looking up trying to make sense out of the frustrating and unfathomable adult world. That's, I never, I didn't realize that seeing that movie so many times that the camera was actually low. I, that's crazy. Ralphie's uh, rapture, you know, as his hand glides up the lamb's prosthetic fishnet leg, uh, that reaction was actually totally real. <laughs> Uh, when the film was released, movie critic Roger Ebert said, uh, My guess is either nobody will go to see it, or millions of people will go to see it. That's goofy. The modestly budgeted little comedy opened in 1983, the week before Thanksgiving, on fewer than 900 screens. The film took about $2 million in uh, on its first weekend, and double that on Thanksgiving weekend. It's pretty solid business for the time. The movie was getting strong word-of-mouth support, but MGM hadn't counted on the movie receiving much success and did not schedule distribution to more than the opening screens for the lead-up to Christmas. Thus, A Christmas Story disappeared from theaters, abruptly elbowed into the theatrical void by the bigger seasonal studio movies of the day, most notably Scarface and Christine. Ah, those Christmas classics. Ultimately, A Christmas Story collected about $19 million at the box office. It was a good showing, but, you know, not great. At the same time A Christmas Story was taking off, MGM was collapsing. Heavily in debt, it sold its film library to Ted Turner in 1986. One of those films was A Christmas Story, which is how it turned up on Turner's Superstation Cable Channel. TBS, right? Is, is, was that the Superstation? It was really Turner's idea to run it as a perennial holiday movie. When Turner Broadcasting merged with Time Warner, Inc. in 1997... Time Warner began running the film on a continuous loop from Christmas Eve through Christmas Day on TNT. Turner Network Television. Teller, television? Turner Network Television. 24 hours of a Christmas story. 12 showings over the holiday season. In 2004, it was moved to TBS. Sorry. I, I'm sorry about all this tangent Christmas story stuff. Uh, but, you know, when am I going to be able to talk about A Christmas Story at length again, really? Th this book, uh, A Fistful of Fig Newtons, is the only Gene Shepard book I have. Well, at the moment, anyway. So when is this ever going to come around for me again? So, I'm sorry if I'm indulging a little bit. I, I, I apologize. All right. Back to Gene and his untimely mystery and end. Then, the book. Well, wait. Okay, so his... His mystery wasn't untimely, and his death wasn't a mystery. It was actually pretty mundane. Unfortunate, yes, but also not unnatural, I guess. Uh, still, I'll explain. Gene liked his privacy a lot. His, uh, his date of birth, um, even the one I gave earlier, is, uh, is actually in contention. It's been given variously as either July 21st or July 26th. Hell, even the years range from 1921 to 1929. He was married four times, but only three, starting with a second wife, are mentioned in most sources. His first was his first wife uh, marriage. His first wife marriage, yeah. His first his first marriage was to Barbara Mattoon in March of 1947. His second was Joan Laverne Warner. They were married September 9th, 1950 to 1957. They had two kids, a son Randall and daughter Adrian. Jean's third wife was Lois June Nettleton uh, from December of 1960 to uh, 1967. His last wife was Nancy Lee Prescott 
uh, alternately lo- known as a uh, Lee Brown uh, in some places. Um, they were married from 1977. Married. Jesus, listen to me. They were married from 1977 to uh, 1912 uh, to his death uh, in Florida, um, USA. <laughs> When Gene passed away, his wife, Lee Brown, who was also his agent and producer, uh, who herself died after 21 years of marriage, uh, told a family friend that they had no children and that there were no survivors. As far as children were concerned, uh, that wasn't true, of course. Uh, But whether she knew that or not, who knows? Like I said, Gene valued his privacy. Even Gene's own son said he didn't know his dad was ever married to Lois Nettleton. What a weird way to go about your days. I mean, I get it, wanting to maintain a modicum of privacy, you know, but it's still weird to me. Unfortunately, it wasn't just confusing personal information and a patchwork history Gene would leave behind. No, sir. He also spread around a fair share of misery, too. As it would happen, a horrible precedent was set in Gene's childhood when his father left him um, and eventually made it its way into Gene's uh, children's lives. Gene left his children and their mother when his son Randall was six, shortly before his parents divorced in 1957. His sister, Adrian Shepard, now 42, was born shortly after Mr. Shepard left. Uh, Randall, uh, his son, said. He went out of his way not to acknowledge that he even had us, said the younger Mr. Shepard, a film editor in Irvington, New York. Um, when he was describing their relationship with their father as estranged. Randall said uh, he didn't even know whether his uncle, who was also named Randall Shepard, uh, Randy Shepard, um, he didn't know whether even whether he was still alive or not, which is kind of sad and terrible. Gene Shepard, the, uh, the not-so-great father, New York radio raconteur, and author... <laughs> I said that wrong, I'm guessing, fuck it, I don't care. An author whose rambling jazz-like monologues on the air puzzled many, delighted others, and earned him a sizable cult following over over two decades. Um, He died of natural causes at 3.20 a.m. in Lee Memorial Hospital near his home in Sanibel Island, Florida. On Saturday, October 16, 1999, he is believed to have been in his 70s. Some sources say 68, some say 78. No one is really sure other than Gene Shepard, but he is dead. Super, super, super dead. Definitely, definitely dead. So this brings us around, not quite in a circle, or even a circle at all, but around to my awful segue into Gene's book from 1987, A Fistful of Fig Newtons. A book consisting of 22 essay stories, collections of stories, essays, stories, in the wonderful voice slash, and or, slash, style of Gene Shep Shepard. I was trying to think of a way to honor Gene, Gene Shepard's style, and, and I, thought, I thought he should talk about his own stories. So I rummaged around and found some of him talking about him. Well, him talking about his book in particular. He does it better than I could, seriously. For instance, here is a... Here he is talking about the first story in the book. Uh, the, the story is titled A Fistful of Fig Newtons, which comes from the book A Fistful of Fig Newtons. How convenient, Gene. He's telling it to, uh, he's, the interview is with his fellow legend, radio and TV and such, uh, the equally dead Larry King on The Larry King Show, who named the show after the guy hosting it. Kind of like I did. As it happens... These guys, Gene and Larry, have a knack for repurposing obvious titling. The Fistful of Fig Newtons. Do you title your own books? Of course. Right. What is A Fistful <laughs> of Fig Newtons about? I do not imagine it is about the cookie. No, it's about a great... I have that hunch. It's about a great derby. It's a tremendous athletic contest that took place at 2 o'clock in the morning in a Midwestern University dormitory between four men who were being consumed by boredom. It was a Friday night, and it was raining hard. And all of a sudden, one of them announced that he had hidden under his bunk a two-pound box of Fig Newtons. And the four of them sat there and ate the box of Fig Newtons. The rain kept coming down, Larry. 
And outside, you could see across the campus square, you could see a, a, an arrow pointing down at Joe's Route 41 Diner. And you could see that red arrow just saying, eat, 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 eat. And they kept sitting around eating. It was two, three in the morning. And then a, an intellectual from the floor below came wandering up who was a history major, tall, thin, six feet four, 85 pounds. He looks in at the crowd. He says, are you gentlemen all enjoying these fig newtons? And I said, yes. He said, any of you care for a sporting venture tonight? And the four of them looked up, one of whom, by the way, was a Big Ten tackle. He was ready for any kind of sporting ventures. And he said, what kind of sporting venture? He says, well, I have here a box of, well, some would call it a laxative. It is also said by some that it is a delicious chocolate-flavored medicine. We're going to have a contest tonight. Okay. Who can stay in the room the longest? Now, how did that... Can you... Uh, the hardest thing to explain. The birth of that idea. The birth of that idea. Well, it came from a thing that happened to me in the Army. Um... Uh, I was in a I was in a radar company, Larry, and we were isolated. This was like MASH. We were isolated millions of miles from civilization in a steaming jungle where the temperature was two, three hundred degrees, and at late at night you could hear the sound of bull uh alligators looking for business sexually. You hear this roar out in the darkness. We were bored, covered with mosquitoes. And somebody discovered that the Coke machine, when you'd put a dime in for a Coke, a bottle would come out, and there was a name of a city on the bottom. It Still would say, true. it would say Cleveland, or it would say Detroit. And so a betting pool began to build up. Who would get a bottle from the furthest away this week? And by the end of the week, there would be maybe five, six, seven hundred, a thousand dollars riding on this. And it hit me one late at night. That boredom, I think, is one of the great motivating forces in the world. I think people fight wars because of boredom. And, 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 and that's the story of, of, of these guys did this insane thing out of pure boredom. Boredom is a greater, is a greater motivating force in people's lives than sex or anything. Damn, was he good at this or what? He would have made a fortune in podcasting. That interview led me through a... That, that that interview actually led me down a whole uh, Gene Shepard rabbit hole, which sounds a lot more gross than it was. There were a slew of Gene Shepard interviews on YouTube, lots of his shows, both radio and TV, uh, book readings and such. Ultimately, that led me to this gem of uh, Gene talking to David Letterman. Uh, it's amazing the way Letterman comes, seems to come into this interview ready to sleepwalk his way through it. Kind of a, 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 a let's get through this boring shit so we can get to the party guests that people really came for uh, kind of attitude. Um, yet, by the end of Shep's time in the chair, Gene has Dave in the audience in the palm of his hand. The guy really, really was a great storyteller. <laughs> From uh, the book A Fistful of Fig Newtons, uh, tell me about, for example, the chapter Lost at Sea. Well, Lost at Sea... Uh... David, is about a, a, a thing that all of us have gone through. You went to school once, didn't you? I had some education, right. yes. Well, I, <laughs> here I was at the age of nine, uh, already in a, in, a, in a bad position in life because I was going to a school named after the worst president in history. And I didn't know it. It was the Warren G. Harding School. And I imagine there's some kid right now going to the Richard Nixon school. He isn't it the Richard Nixon? <laughs> you know? And I was going to the Warren G. Harding school. I'm sitting back there in the alphabetical ghetto, the last uh, third of the alphabet, me and Schwartz, and Chester Wisniewski, and behind us was Zinsmeister. And we'd sit there. We couldn't see. We couldn't hear. And that classroom would extend up in front of us, and you could see the sun coming in. And Miss Shields would be up there in the front. She was wearing a, a blue Brillo pad on her head. <laughs> we couldn't see what was going on. See, and, and, and I'd hear her talking. She'd say things like, And to me, that's education. Pretty much it. Huh? And once in a while, a word would come out. And I remember one day we were sitting back there, and I hear this phrase, Bolivia 
Exports, 10. <laughs> the only thing I ever learned all of my days at school. <laughs> <laughs> and I use it to this day. I said it to Norman Mailer the other day. I said, Mailer, Bolivia exports 10. He says, my God, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> then you walk away quick and get a drink, you know, before you're, you're discovered. Yeah. But algebra was the thing that finally proved my undoing, Dave. And I remember I went to high school. I had been able to go all the way through my grade school without once being called on. And I had learned a technique in grade school, see, how not to get called on. Now, every kid has, a, has his own technique. And my technique was to keep a line of kids between me and the teacher. Just keep moving, see, like a snake. <laughs> she could never see me, so I keep moving back and forth. <laughs> Schwartz would just slowly sink down into a seat, so he had his own technique. Zinsmeister, who was Catholic, you could hear his beads going. <laughs> <laughs> you know the fear of failure. See, well, I get it. I get it in a high school, see, and I had been able to fake my way all of the way through grade school. Never got called on, and all of a sudden, I'm in this class. And it's Mr. Settlemeyer, and it's algebra, algebra. And five minutes into the class, the first day, Dave, I knew I was six weeks behind. <laughs> the kids were raising their hands up there, and they were they were answering questions. I couldn't see, I couldn't hear. And six weeks go by, I have done no algebra whatsoever. And that fantastic day came when I'm sitting back there in the back of the room. And I've given up. I can hear the sound of the glee club singing in the distance. <laughs> Somebody is kicking a football. And I'd never been called on it 13 years of school. When I did the worst thing that a guerrilla fighter can do, I lost my concentration. I'm sitting there listening to the glee club singing, and I'm watching a moat of dust drifting down. When all of a sudden, out of the darkness, I hear Mr. Settlemiter say, Shepherd. <laughs> I hear a thin squeal from Schwartz. <laughs> <laughs> Just grazed him. Yeah, he yeah. says, my God, they got Shepard. If, <laughs> if they could get Shepard, they could get any of us. There's no hope. You know? And I got up and I walked up. And of course, I had all these things I had prepared, you know, before I was called on. I was going to say things like, uh, repeat the question, please. He says, yes, get up here and give me the value of C. I walked up to the front of the class, and it was the first time I had actually, clearly, David, seen a, an equation. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was eight, nine yards long. It was thick. It had fringe, little, little things with twos on it. <laughs> and you know what? I couldn't believe, Dave. All this stuff stretched over the whole board, and at the end it said, equals zero. <laughs> And it hits me. All this crap equals nothing. What is this? <laughs> uh, tell me now, there's another reference to the Great Ice Cream War. Oh, yeah, that was when I was a kid. There was a place called the Igloo. And uh, me and Schwartz, every day at lunchtime, would go to the Igloo. Same guy, Schwartz. Yeah, me and Schwartz. And, uh, of course, me and Schwartz, neither one of us knew any algebra or anything. See, we, <laughs> <laughs> we were working our way through ignorance the way other people work their way through the Bible. <laughs> and, you know, we didn't know that we were ignorant. Yeah. See, so that made it easier. So one night, <laughs> we're down at the Igloo, see, and, and Mr. Leggett is, is operating the Igloo. Now, Igloo was the big ice cream store in town. Now, this is a big town. This is not uh, Happy Days or anything, see. And <laughs> what town would this be? This is the toughest town this side of the Barbary Coast. It's a town called Hammond, Indiana. It took guts, David, to just be a kid there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a mean town. In fact, I, I remember late at night, you could hear the sound of pool balls hitting together. And I, I, at the age of 12, at maybe 12, 13, I could go out at night, and me and Schwartz would siphon gas. And at 12, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I could tell what brand of gas I was drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I preferred Philip 66 for after dinner. It was That's, nice, yeah. clean. <laughs> <laughs> Had a nice dry quality to it, so me and, me and Schwartz used to go to the Igloo, see, and one night we're sitting at home, the old man is sitting there drinking a can of Blatt's beer, but my mother's wearing her chenille Chinese red bathrobe with the aluminum rheostats in the hair. <laughs> By the way, we had a sink that every night at 6.15 would go... 
My too much blabs, up huh? with the Brillo pad, see? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she figured she could brill away all evil in the world if she got the ultimate Brillo pad. That she'd look down in the sink. There'd be a pause. The old man would put his, his blats down on the table and look up. And then the sink would go... <laughs> <laughs> My mother jumped back. One beat. It'd just go one beat, boop, and then <laughs> up would come Mrs. Bruner's coffee grounds from next door. Mm. Yeah, it could we have been worse, I guess. Well, it was Hammond, you know. <laughs> we traded coffee. Yes, it was worse one night, by the way. Mr. Bruner came home at 2 o'clock in the morning and the plumbing backed up. Oh, my. And that was fantastic. So began to learn about reality, and, and we used to hang around the igloos. So one, this one night, the phone rings, and Mrs. Anderson is on the phone. She says to my mother, Mrs. Anderson, she says, they're having a price war down at the igloo. Now, do you know what a price war is? That's when prices go down. It's hard to believe it. So we run out and jump in the Oldsmobile. My old man was an Oldsmobile owner, David, the way other people are Baptists. <laughs> you wake him up at 2 in the morning and say, what are you? And he says, I'm an Olds man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we get to Olds and we drive down. There's a whole crowd of people. Thousands of people are going down the street. It turns out that right across the street from the igloo, a place called the Happy Cow has opened. Actually, it was owned by Bordens. You remember Elsie the cow? Had a big plastic cow, and he is going to put the igloo out of business. Big corporation. And Mr. Leggett has written on the front of his window, ice cream cones, triple deck, seven cents. My God, everybody from the... From, they were coming from Michigan. <laughs> well, the guy comes running out from, from the happy cow, and he, we're all standing there waiting in line to get our ice cream cones, and he writes on his window, ice cream cones, three cents. It's 2 o'clock in the morning now, and they're starting to arrive from Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> the panic was on him, and finally Liggett had had it. He had it up to here. He just went out and wrote all across the front of his store, ice cream cones free, all you can take. And God, the place rocked. And two days later, the happy cow was out of business. They did it. Mr. Liggett did it. And it taught me at that point that if you're willing to give away everything you got, you can win, gang. You can win. Let's hear it for Leggett. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I came into this book because of the title. All right. It was a bizarre book setting on the shelf of that title of a fistful of fig newtons fucking weird i'm pretty sure i picked uh i picked it up at goodwill which if you're an, an avid reader and you should be uh thrift stores are a great way to find surprisingly eclectic uh books uh, and a variety of them from f both recent and old titles i'm always surprised so uh so when i saw a fistful of fig newtons I had I had to see what it was about. The author's name did seem kind of familiar, and I didn't know why, really. But it was the title and the 99-cent price tag that really sold me. Now, after reading and learning a little about him, I, uh, I feel he might have a bigger influence on me and what I do here than I, than I would have thought. Plus, hearing his voice brought back a lot of memories of watching A Christmas Story over the years. Then I thought it would have been cool just to talk to him, you know? That's not an easy thing to do, unfortunately, because, you know, of how dead, of how dead he is. So, I had one hell of a time contacting him for this episode. The internet is supposed to hold the collective knowledge of the entire human race, and I think I tried this before, and it didn't work out. But all on the internet and everywhere else, there's not one way to reliably contact a dead person. Hell, get this, the dead of any kind. Human or animal. What the fucking fuck, science? You can't. You haven't figured this out since the last time? You can communicate with someone on the other side of the fucking globe. Damn near simultaneously. With video. But reaching out to one fucking dead person, it's impossible. What is NASA even for? So, in desperation, I reached out to the only person I could think of who might be able to get might be able to get me on the right path to communicating with someone who was super dead and, and not on this earthly plane anymore. You know, how can I get in contact with Gene Shepard? You're joking, right? This is another one of your bits, right? What are you talking about? I'm, I'm serious. It's not a bit. I'm not going to help you dig up Gene Shepard for your podcast, Elton. There's no way in hell that's happening. I'm not asking happening. you to dig up anything, 
oh, okay, because, whoa, I thought you had gone completely insane there for a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no digging up bodies. That's well, crazy. that's good, because things were starting to sound a little unhinged and, frankly, kind of creepy, Elton. I mean, hearing you talk about bringing dead people back, you've got to admit. No. I need your help in contacting Gene Shepard. <laughs> there it is. There it is. There it is. Now, I know you've gone completely insane. Come on. What's the big deal? What it's, What would lead you con- to believe I could possibly contact a dead person, Elton? That's insane. You're insane. Insane like a fox. <laughs> How are you not under constant supervision? Uh, I just want to finish out the episode strong. By raising the dead. By speaking to the dead. That's not better. All right, look, I'll I'll send out an email or something. I'm not promising anything. This is beyond bonkers. I'll say it's for a, 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 a wow, I, I can't even come up with a good reason. Just in the meantime, sign up for some therapy, Elton, and and not the run-of-the-mill stuff either. You're going to need that deep dive business. I will. I, I'm not done. That I need to reevaluate my existence, heavy medicated, multiple doctor, military-grade therapy. Know what I'm saying? I do. I, yes, I do. Hey, thank you. So, thank you. And then I waited, thinking she had given up on me and found some other podcast to ambiguously exist within and participate with, you know, when all of a sudden. Uh, uh, wow. OK, so I called somebody I know who knows a guy who knows another guy who knows a lady. It's not important. They told me what you have to say to. I cannot believe I'm about to say this to conjure the spirit of dead, dead, super dead Gene Shepard. It's a lot of stuff in Latin. What? What have I become in even being part of this? Seriously? What? Oh, this is great! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where do you want me to send this Latin stuff to? What do you mean? What do you mean, what do I mean? I mean, where am I sending this Latin spell thing to conjure the spirit of Gene Shepard is what I mean. You asked for it. I know, but I don't speak Latin. Are you just now finding all the flaws in your bonkers plan now? Well, I don't know how to speak Latin either. Oh, come on. You can do it. I believe in you. You think believing in somebody is going to help them speak a thousand-year-old dead language? It, it couldn't hurt. God help me. Don't ever ask me for anything ever again. I swear. I swear I never will. I promise. I hope this works. And he materializes long enough to eat your face. You're the best, Well, after a lot of help from the internet, practicing all day, and drinking way too much coffee, this is it. This should be you doing this, but when you're already an accomplice in what is probably violating the laws of existence, why stop now, right? You are the, you're the bestest ever. Shut it. Shut it. Shush. And then, uh, and then she spoke the words. At CZ Vox, Artificialis Tantum Genae Fisher Sim Clone, Spiritum Joannis Pastoris Acet Jocularium Dabo, Forcitan Tantum Hunquoque Vocem Artificialum Accipiemus, O Bene Futuis. Then we both waited and waited and did that some more, and then some more we waited. But, uh, and then we waited and waited. But then, how do we know if it worked? I imagine we'll know if and when we hear his tortured screams as he's being dragged back to the realm of the living to participate in a comedy podcast about books, Elton. Jesus, are you serious? How would I know what's going to happen? I've never raised the dead before, Elton. Right. Right. I'm I'm just anxious. I think it worked. I can sense a change. Like, almost like I can feel a new presence here with us. Really? No, but usually I don't feel the presence of dead people. Well, that's great to know. It it doesn't help this, but, but great to know. Oh, 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 I almost forgot. Oh, right, they told me you would need a radio. You have to tune it to a station or something that's just static. I didn't get it. They said something about EVP and other ghost stuff I didn't care to remember because I'm already in this too deep anyway. Plus, I'm fairly sure I may have jeopardized my entry into heaven because of all of this already. So as far as I'm concerned, since I haven't heard back from God yet, I figured less is best. So you're on your own with all that. Well, thanks so much for the help. I th- thank you for everything. 
You are welcome. I'm going to pray to every God I can think of for forgiveness and spray myself and everything I own down with holy water now. Good luck with violating all of the physics and countless religious tenets. I think the universe, God, and everything else should be fine. If if it helps, I take full responsibility. For my sake, I hope so. Oh, and this is on the record. This is all you're doing, Elton. You hear that, God? This is all his fault, not mine. You're such a team player. Uh-huh. Just try not to spook the ghost of Gene Shepard, okay? I'm not reconjuring any more dead radio show hosts. If you scare him off with your insipid tales of the mundane and trial and error style of comedy you keep doing for some reason. Look, just just try not to be, you know, you for the rest of this episode. Maybe that'll work. You're hilarious. Well, somebody around here should take a crack at it sometime, right? Oh, nice. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Hello, uh, hello Gene. Uh, my name is my name is Elton. I'm, hey, I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not uh, sure. Oh, uh, hi. Hi there. Uh Elton, is this a I'm not sure is this an uh, interview what? or uh, or uh, something? Oh. Yes, right. Um yes, I'm an in, I'm an uh, interviewer. I'm an interviewer. This is an interview here. I'm here to um y- uh You're yes. Doing okay to, over um, there? To you to interview. Yes, I'm here to interview you. Yes. Who is it for? Who who is who what for? The interview, Elton. Who's it for? I wasn't given much of a notice or any. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I apologize for that. I was uh it was kind of short notice for me too. It's for the uh, inter- interviewers for the uh, Elton Reads a Book a Week podcast. Uh, I mean, Times Tribune Herald. Uh, d- uh, I'm I'm doing a piece about uh, a, f- a fistful of Fig Newtons. Your wonderful book. Uh, if if you had a few moments to talk about it. Um, oh, about the book. Oh, great. Uh, oh, sure, that's great. Uh, Mm, thank you very much. Well, I'm I, I guess I, I'm ready when you are. Uh, I guess. Okay, great. Thank great. So, uh, let me just um a- ask you um well oh, uh, uh, I, I read the book uh, uh the the fistful of fig newtons um a fistful of fig newtons I thought it was great. Oh well, thank you again. I, I'm glad you liked it. I did a lot. I thought I thought it was funny and uh, uh, uh thought provoking. Uh, the social commentary w- w- was uh, fantastically written. It's w- well balanced. Phenomenal. That's that's oh, good to hear. Oh, it's fantastic. Really. Could could uh, could you tell me more about it? On on the uh, social commentary. Uh, I was thinking more the the book in general. So the audience, the people, the readers, or whatever, whatever they they, they can get a sense. So the list, so they can get a sense about what it's all about. Are you all right? I do. I am. I am. I. I'm just. Uh. I'm nervous. You're. Um. Uh, you're. You're kind of a hero of mine. Oh well, thank you. I'm honored. So, uh, fistful of fig newtons. Right. Sure. Sure. Well. Uh. What is it all about? It's. Uh. It's hard to say. It covers the life of uh, Mr. Leggett and the Great Ice Cream War, and uh, Schwartz and Flick are in there. They all. The gang. Uh. uh goes to summer camp. A uh, camp called, by the way, Camp Nava Walanaki, and it's so it's uh, it's 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 a lot of stuff. What can I say? So it's about memories, memories like like an like a nostalgia trip. I didn't I didn't get that feeling. For... Well, no, it's not. No, no, it's not nostalgia. I never mention any specific time period in the book. You know what I've tried to do in my writing these these stories is is something that I'm afraid very few writers in America have tried to to write. To write about American life that's apart from from all the public problems, so to speak, the uh, American traumas, the uh, uh, sex and racism, all that stuff. I've tried to write uh, uh, something more universal uh, yes, apart that, from that. That's the feeling I got. It's the stories of everyday life kind of yes, thing. Yes, yes, exactly. You you got that, it. That everybody can relate to. Every age kind of. Absolutely. You're you're a great storyteller. It, it really comes oh, through. Oh, well, gosh, thank you very much again. Generally speaking, though, my uh, audi- uh, audience may not be familiar with your particular uh, style. I mean, but generally, 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 sorry, generally the book is about um, 
Is, 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 well, as ahead. I said before, uh, it's about, it's about... Uh, the town I grew up in and those characters. Though it, uh, uh, it uh, overall, it follows Ralph Parker on a long trip through the, uh, the Lincoln Tunnel from New York to New Jersey, which is an extraordinary feat of engineering, that, uh, that tunnel. Have you ever seen it? Not yet. I keep trying, though. Oh, well, let me tell you, it's, it's a modern marvel of misspent time and wasted life, I tell you. You really should see it in person. Just long, bleak, and marvelous. So he's, he's sitting in the tunnel, stuck in that traffic, just amazing and god-awful traffic. He, uh, he starts to reminisce. You know, he's just sitting there and goes over all of these scenes of his life and uh, starts... He starts to speculate on all sorts of things uh, about the future and the state of culture, as you mentioned before, social commentary. The reader travels with um, Ralph through all of this, all of his memories of his childhood in the Army uh, and life in college after uh, after getting on the GI Bill. Uh, I drew a lot from my own uh, uh, experiences then uh, mixed in uh, – sorry – it mixed it with a little fantasy, you know, some fiction. I, uh, I think it came out pretty well. Uh, obviously, I was satisfied with it enough to want to see it in print, you know? I hear you. Yeah, no. I I think it did. It felt like to me like I was on a, like I was on a trip through someone else's mind, you know? Yes, exactly. The ruminations on what a ah, crazy place New Jersey is and that uh, beautiful, brilliant light there at the end of that fantastic tunnel. Then his thoughts are brought back again to his past, to that a summer camp in those woods, his first summer at Camp Nava Walanaki, getting picked on by the older boys, jerks, the lot of them, and then forced into all those menial duties like cleaning up trash. Real formative stuff, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. The the I like I like the uh the archaeology advertisement thing. Too. That was pretty funny. Oh, right. The uh, the flash forward to the future where you know, archaeologists are uh, they're digging up New York and their impressions of this culture based on all the uh, the uh, the TV commercials. It's always been something I like to play around with. As a matter of fact, I did a similar thing on my show that ran on uh, a WNJM out in New Jersey on their uh, it was a little public access station out there. Oh, it was great. Um, I love doing it. That was fun to write, I tell you what. So many people do a flashback, so why not a flash forward, you know? Plus, uh, any time I can rankle the fur of so-called futurists, it's a good time. I'm sure it is. I'll have to remember that next time I run into one. Uh, say, thank you for your time, Mr. Shepard. I really, uh, really appreciate you Oh, for you crying out this. loud. Was that the whole interview? Nope, that was it. Boy, the way you were talking, I thought it was going to be a hard one, you know, a real struggle for the ages. I'm just kidding. You made it real easy on me, all right? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Oh, sure. No problem. And you can call me Shep. Th hey, anytime. Th th sorry if I was a little, uh, you know, I'm nervous. I, well, I've Elton, really I think you did this, a great you know. job. You sound uh, a little inexperienced if... Uh, if you don't mind me saying, but you did a great job. Believe me, I uh, know it can be difficult, but but you pulled it off really well. Th thank you, thank you, Mr. Shepard. That uh, that means a lot, it really does. I'll let you get back to the rest of your uh, your day or not or night or uh, you know. Uh, I, I I appreciate your time. Thank uh, you too, Elton. Take care. Has God struck you with lightning yet? I can come back. No, nothing like that. I think it went really well. He was he was nice. Nothing weird happened. Well, I'm glad that all worked out. As creepy and an affront against all that is holy as that was, I'd hate to have to resurrect a dead man again. Yeah, that was crazy. Thank you for helping me again. Don't worry about it, because that's the last time I ever help you, ever. <laughs> Well, hopefully we won't, there won't be any more dead raising. <laughs> Who died? Oh, shit. Perfect. Thank you for listening to Elden Reads a Book a Week. If you enjoyed this episode, why not give it a five-star review on the podcast app of your choice? Or hell, how about, how about all of them? Every podcast thing you ever listen to. I'm kidding. Just one would be cool. If you really, really, really enjoyed it, 
you might consider becoming a contributor through Patreon. There's extra stuff on there. You can yell at me and, and get a whole extra podcast on top of this one. You can follow the podcast on all the social media stuff, too. That's something. You can also recommend it to a friend. Say, hey, you should listen to this moron, Elton. Talk about books, kind of, but not all the time. It's really weird. You should listen to it. He's stupid. That's something. You can do that. That's something to do, too. That helps. Uh, but, but above all else, though. Thank you for uh, taking the time to listen. I really appreciate it. Oh, and maybe read a book this week. Don't let them don't let them die out. All right? Huh? Thank you very much. Bye-bye.